Good morning, everyone. Uh, just have a shout out to Texas and uh, all the great music that comes from Texas. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right on. So we might get into a little battle here because Sean and I went to competing like fine art school. So, you know, you never know what's going to yeah. happen. <laughs> right. <you're> right. <laughs> Right on. So, guys, I usually like to start with something kind of just, you know, chill and, and see see just what's on our minds musically. So uh, here's a question for both of you. All right. You only get three albums to listen to for one year. Everything else is taken away. You got to hear three albums on repeat for one year. Three albums. Go. Sean. <laughs> no, you, you definitely go first. <laughs> Oh, wow. Wow. Um, uh, all right. I'm going to try to have a balanced diet here. So I'm going to, I'm going to say, um, I'm going to say Firebird Sweet by Stravinsky, directed by Leonard Bernstein. Mm. I'm going to say, um, um, Abbey Road by the Beatles. Yep. And and I think I'm going to say I know I love him by Nancy Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going light, medium and heavy there with your meals. I, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's a question you need like months to prepare for, but that's all I got in the 10 <laughs> seconds that I had that I had. Nice. Nice. Sean uh yeah that's a that's a hard one um i uh <laughs> uh and i was i was still trying to just think even mike was talking about like i don't know <laughs> that's <laughs> not a light question rodney you it's not a light, question light. At all. It's, like, it's like you wake up and somebody just starts throwing bricks at you it's like which way do you go <laughs> um i think well I, I i love there's a i love chucky booker's nice and wild so, so i listen to that pretty much all the time yes. um uh another one would be uh oh ahmad jamal um oh. I, I, I got now i gotta pick one of those records which, <laughs> you know that's i'd say ahmad jamal and 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 uh and this record I've been digging back into for a minute now, Mr. Hands, Herbie Hancock. Oh, Herbie, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So there you go. You know, it's always tough, right? And and if it was one year or one month, it'd be different choices. If it was the rest of your life, right. it'd be a different choice, right? So right. Well, cool. Glad glad we got that out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> so uh this question's uh for Michael. What's snarky puppy mean and what's the message behind the name? uh that's a very easy question to answer because it, it cool. really doesn't mean anything and there's absolutely no message <laughs> like a so, seinfeld I mean, moment <laughs> it is it is it's a show about nothing i mean it's a band about nothing no i i mean the, it was it was just a name that i actually kind of robbed from my brother because he was going to name a band that and he didn't um and the name just always kind of stuck in my head so when i when i put the group together for the first time we had a gig in, in the basement of j and j's pizza in denton texas and uh in, on the town square you know the first the first gig and 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 i wasn't thinking of it as like a band that i'd be leading you know now like 17 years later i just thought of it as like i have some music i'm gonna get some people together but i gotta call the band something um you know so uh yeah so basically i i i you know, grabbed grabbed this name and um did you have to fight it out with your brother when you got home or <laughs> no uh no he was happy that it got some use you know okay. but I, I just thought i just thought like snarky puppy that's funny and everybody loves puppies and it's easy to make a poster i picked up a, a photo with like 11 puppies and put everybody's name over each pup it was just like a silly thing you know and then nice. that was it cool know? Uh, so, uh, saying that you just drew that out the air, obviously from your brother, uh, did you envision Snarky Puppy being what it is today? Or was it more about when you started out, just making music and see what comes? Did you have, you know, was there actually a purpose or was it just about, you know, jamming? Um, no, no, no. I, I'm, I'm actually, I mean, Sean can attest to this, pro you know, most likely to a fault that I'm, I'm not, I'm not like, I don't just kind of like do things like just like to, I don't call people to get together and jam like for mm. me there always always has to be kind of like a project you know like I, I really like ever since I was a kid I, like I remember what, this, this is really deep and obsessive 
Um, but when I was like a kid and I was playing video games on my computer, there was a game called um, Joe Montana Football that I had on my on my dad's like you know a- IBM or whatever you know <laughs> computer. And you were able to go in and change the colors of the teams and change the names. This was like the first game. And I, I created an entire league because I was more interested in college football than pro football. So I went in and for the all 30 teams that were there, I changed the entire rosters of the players to fit college teams. So I had like Florida State with the full roster. Because I had like these books that had the rosters of all the college <laughs> players. I did it for 30 teams so that I could have like college football games, even though the game was a pro football. Like, I'm always been like really obsessive about projects, about organizing things, and so for me, no, it was always from the beginning. It was like this is a this is an opportunity to workshop music that I was writing or the covers that I wanted to play. It was never like a ca- casual thing. But I, that said, I didn't expect it to become a professional band. I just was looking at it as like a project to play original music. Gotcha. Cool. So I just want to remind the students, if you have any questions, drop them in the Q&A there and we'll get to them as, as we move along. So this question's, uh, you know, we've all kind of picked up. We Obviously, we all picked up an instrument at some point. We had, you know, some of us have had teachers. We went through, a, you know, a, some kind of musical program somewhere, typically starting in, in grade school uh, at any level. So, Sean, uh, what was your approach through all that process to defining your style as a musician? Oh, uh, well, I guess my, my, my approach to defining my style would probably be my gospel roots, you know, you know, growing up in church, playing in church since I was about what, four or five years old, mm. you know, and that was more of the thing that would kind of carve out who Sean Martin, you know, would be. And then of course, you know, taking, uh, I said classical lessons, took classical piano lessons with a lady named Carolyn Campbell here in Dallas, uh, starting early at the age of four, as well as, you know, started, that's when I also started learning, you know, jazz, because she was actually, she was a classical piano teacher, but she loved jazz, Mm -hmm. right? And so she was like, you know, okay, okay, that's cool. We're going to play this Beethoven sonata. We're going to play this Bach prelude view, but I want you to listen to, listen to this John Coltrane album, you know, you know, and listen to, you know, here's, here's some blues scales, you know, we're going to, we're going to work with that. you know, and then as I got older, I saw how everything was kind of intertwined, right? You know, you know, I started to see how, you know, you know, gospel music, you know, drops roots in jazz and blues and, you know, and how it all comes together. And you start looking at choral music and hymns and how the classical part play, plays in that. So everything kind of started coming together. And so I just kind of took bits and pieces. And it was great because like in my house, my mom, my mom loves Jesus. I think my mom and Jesus went to like middle school together. I don't really know. <laughs> She's like a very religious person. My dad is kind of like, you know, he's the one that's, you know, you know, the earthly guy, right? So upstairs, my mom would listen to like Mahalia Jackson or Ooh. Thomas Whitfield, something like that, you know, you know, gospel, the Hawkins singers. And then downstairs, my dad listened to Bobby, Bobby Bland, BB King. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He would be downstairs, but, right? Yeah, yeah. She's upstairs. <laughs> I just I just I just stood in the middle of the stairs and got both of them, you know. <laughs> nice. Nice. That's why I say so, Texas music. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Michael. Uh, you you know, how did you find yourself? I mean, a lot of this, you know, we take in influences from people we like and all these kinds of things. So how did you find yourself as a musician, not so much as uh, your teachers or approaches, but just develop your own thing to even then become the leader of this incredible band? Yeah, I mean, I feel like from from the beginning, I've, like, I think of myself more as a composer than a player, you know, mm-hmm. like, I feel like from the first time I started to compose, even though the, the first songs I composed were terrible, you know, we all start from zero, right? So no one just starts composing something great. Um, but I felt like even in those first compositions, there was like a, a style or something or like a taste, you know, a certain kind of taste, not necessarily good taste, but a certain kind of taste that was mine, you know, that, that was... <laughs> That was coming out in the songs. Um, and, you know, it's just like anything else. You do something a, a, a hundred times and the 60th time you do it, it sounds less bad than the sixth time you do it. You know, you just like slowly get better um, from from trying, you mm-hmm. know, and that's really the most important thing is is putting in the effort to, to end the time to allow yourself to improve instead of saying, I'm not good, I'm not going to do it anymore, you know. Um, So, you know, compositionally, I felt like that was there early on. As a player, I didn't, you know, and and even after 
four years of college, I didn't feel like I really had my own voice on the instrument. Um, and it really wasn't until I moved to Dallas and started playing on the scene that Sean grew up on, really, which was the gospel and R&B, you know, the black music scene in Dallas that, you know, that I really started to feel like I, I had a voice, you know, um, once that sound got, you know, deep, deep, deeper in me in, in terms of being ingrained. Um, and, and really, you know, this sounds kind of like a, a contradictory, but for anyone out there who's, you know, I guess we're all trying to find who we are and what our, what our sound and our voice is as musicians, it sounds contradictory, but the best thing to do is to, is to transcribe other people, is to learn the way that other people play. You know, that Sean plays the way that he plays because he studied, you know, the music of Ahmad Jamal and B.B. King and Mahalia Jackson and Walter Hawkins and Snoop Dogg. And you know what I mean? Because he's learned that music and, and he's transcribed, you know, even if it's not like transcribing, writing out sheet music, it's like he's learned those songs. He's learned that emotion. And, you know, I, I think that's any great musician that really has their own sound. That's going to be a common theme. I think is that they've spent a lot of time learning from other musicians and not just thinking about themselves. It sounds kind of contradictory, but I think like the worst way to find your own sound is to only focus on yourself. <laughs> That's right. You know what I mean? I, I think I think you know you expand and you listen to a lot of different stuff and you take what you like from each artist and that's who you are. Yeah. Because you're gonna like different things than Sean likes and right. than I like. You know, and we take those specific things. So you become the gumbo of all that you've taken yeah. in. Yeah. We're all gumbos. Yeah, <laughs> it should be. Um, all the gumbo, one of the two. Uh, it's a great. <laughs> <laughs> There's a great question from one of the students. Mason Cardin asks, "What has kept you playing music for so many years? Have you ever fallen out of love with it?" Is this for either of us? Yeah, either of you. Okay. You got it. Let me see. Well, I fell out of love with music. Today is the 27th of April. Uh, I probably fell out of love again with music yesterday on the 26th of April. <laughs> and then I re fell in love with it again in 2019, 18, about now, you know, I mean, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a thing, you know, it's, it's definitely a thing. And I, I get that question a lot of times, um, you know, and, and what's funny is, is I always say, I never really fall out of love with music. I always fall out of love with the music business. And what that means is, is the, the the practice of, you know, you know the, the music will always, you know, it's always going to be there. But the business, even from the financials all the way down to the work that you sometimes have to put in, the practice that, that's transcribing, the, you know, sometimes it, like that's the music business. And sometimes it's hard to stay, you know, in rhythm, in love with that. So that's that's always my thing. But yeah, it happens, you know. Yeah. And when you do, you do, take take a break, break up to make up. That's all we do, <laughs> you know. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, question uh, from Mike. Uh, being that, you know, most of us musicians in the Western Hemisphere have access to those same 12 notes, uh, what's your advice on creating and crafting those 12 notes into an identifiable style? Um, well, I guess the first advice that I would give is to not think about it that way at all. <laughs> that I wouldn't think about, like, how do I use these notes to be unique? You know, mm -hmm. or how do I use like like the notes are 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 building elements in an architectural idea do you know what i mean the notes are not mm -hmm. the idea sure so like i think about notes and rhythms and harmony as like these are just like like stone on a wall right you know i'm not focused on the stone i'm focused on the house mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying so i, I would think about it more as like that notes are just things that we use when we're sharing vocabulary, musical vocabulary, and our identities come through in our vocabulary, you know? So what I would say is like, you know, yeah, when you're trying to find an identifiable sound, really what we're talking about is we're not going out in the forest and searching for something that's out there that's external. We're really like our identifiable sound is like right there. Mm -hmm. it's, our, it's our musical fingerprint of which everyone has their own unique thing. So really our search isn't going out into the forest and finding something new. It's going inside and figuring out how how to best reveal that inside to the to the world. So it's already there. Your musicianship is already inside and your uniqueness is already inside. What we have to do is like um, 
we have to uh, feed um, and nourish, I guess is the word that I'm looking for, nourish that inside with knowledge, with studying, with transcribing, with learning our, our music theory, with, with learning musical genres and, and styles and songs so that we can really bring that fingerprint out, that we can mm -hmm. make it really clearly known um, who we are. So, I mean, that would, that would be my advice. I wouldn't be looking at the elements of music and how we can manipulate them to find our sound. I, I, sure. I would be thinking about it more like vocabulary. But the more you know, the more you grow, right? So, uh, Sean, you've been playing jazz a while. You've mentioned since four, at least you've been at the piano since four years old, studying different styles uh, since we're jazz month and this is a jazz class. Uh, how has jazz evolved? How is jazz evolving today from the more traditional sounds and, and compositions? Like wh what can some of these students look forward to as far as, you know, again, performance, compositional style that's changed from a lot of the stuff we listen to. Yeah, we we do respect, uh, you know, the Ahmad Jamal's and Oscar Peterson's and the Chet Baker's and those guys. But, you know, that was one era. What era are we in now or have you see it evolving? Well, it's, it's some, in my opinion, there's a there's a rebirth and the, and the rebirth is really within the blend of hip hop and jazz. Um, and when I, and when I say hip hop, I'm talking about like, like Dilla or, you know, um, you know, Mad Libs and taking this jazz approach over these, you know, these backbeats. I think that the one thing that has been liberating is I, I think that we are slowly but surely getting away from the fake book. You know, mm. you know, you want, you know, you go to, go those, to jazz, the, yeah, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Carry like, the stack of know. them. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, right, exactly. You know, you go to, you go to a gig, you got, you know, you know, the real book volume one, two, and three. <laughs> and then, you know, and now, you know, somebody calls a tune on the bandstand, they trying to follow, you know, find the, you know, you know, find the tune. And I think now it's more of experimenting with not just the music, but the cultures, you know, you know, I mean, you could, you know, you can say what you want, but, you know, you know, crying thing is, this is, is ex expressional jazz, you know. Um, they took take a look at like you know uh, Robert Glasper, you know, who's you know you know killing it out of Houston, Texas, by the way. That's right. Um, you know, I mean, we, and, but, but then you look at cats like Theo Croker, you know what I'm saying? You know, that's you no, know, that's you know, blown out the water. But there's this, there's still this hip hop ish element to it, you know. Then you got cats like Christian Sands, who you know, it's and so it's you know, you know, Christian Scott attuned, you know. Everything is kind of evolving to another thing now, you know. Mm. Right on. Um, as far as uh, so, so Michael, you've been mm. doing this now a while with Snarky Puppy and a bunch of other projects that you work on, from classical things to 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 all this fusion stuff you're doing. How do you keep growing your musical knowledge and then integrating it into your work? How do you what What's new for you? Because you're you're at a high level, you know. We can all you know say you're at a high mm -hmm. level, but how do you keep Keep it there, and then also keep expanding, keep keep growing that. Well, first off, I mean, I, I feel I feel like I should say that um, I'm hungrier now to be a student than I ever have been. You know, wow. much wow. much more now. And it, like, it, it, my favorite thing in the world to do right now is practice. And I can't say that that was the case when I was in college. <laughs> I mean, I practiced a lot. You know, I was practicing about ten hours a day, but I, it it wasn't my favorite thing to do. I was doing it because I needed to do it. And now, like practicing is like a joy like if I had to choose between watching my favorite movie and practicing it would be practicing you know um so I think the first element you know in that in the answer to that question is about just being curious and being hungry to learn you know that that we're always going to learn more when we want to you know and when we have curiosity about the things that we're learning um and I would also say that we never stop being students as musicians you know, and, and the minute that you stop thinking about yourself as a student, um, I think you start putting yourself on a bad path. You know, the minute that you sit back in the chair and say, yeah, I did everything that I, you know, I'm everything that I wanted to be, mm -hmm. you know, it's the quickest way to stop growing and to stop elevating. So, you know, for me, what I've done is um, uh, I've started, I, I, I basically just got te new teachers. <laughs> so I have like, you know, I have three teachers two in Turkey and one in Morocco and um, and I take lessons from them. you know I do wow. some lessons or what or you know I lived in I went to Turkey for two and a half months to study there with my with two of those teachers and so I just like you know when I say I'm a student I'm not talking about it in like a, a like a 
hypothetical or like metaphorical way. I like I'm literally a student. Like I literally take lessons with people, <laughs> Nice. which is for me is like, you know, why would that ever stop? You sure. know, why, why, sure. why would we ever stop doing that? So for me, that's, that's how I, I feel like I kind of maintain inspiration and, and new ideas, you know? Right on. Um, yeah. <laughs> hey, Sean, how do, how, how do you go about that? How do you, you, you've already come from a vast background of music, but how do you keep your knowledge growing uh, even into other areas and integrated into your work. Yes, yeah, it's, it's kind of it's the, along the same lines, man. You know, you know, and of course, you know, Mike was speaking uh, from a non-metaphorical uh, side of of being a being a student. You know, but I think in life, period, you never stop being a student. Mm. You know, you never stop, you never stop learning. Uh, the only people that stop learning are the dead ones, right? So, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, so you know, I always make it a point to you know, listen to new things, find out new vibes. And 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 to be to be fair, as a music producer, I have to. Mm-hmm. You know, I have to I have to be able to digest, you know, different styles, you know, different uh, arrays of music, you know, because I, I, I can't become a stale producer, right? You know, right. I can't be the one that that I only do, you know, this specific, you know, kind of music, you know, because you know what the client calls and they want. A country record what the client calls they want a neo soul record what the client calls they want a gospel record what they, you know and so i have to always keep my ears to the streets you know mm. and that's that's primarily my biggest thing is always digesting uh you know you not know, always digesting something different something new you know right on uh, <clears throat> so back to you sean uh mm-hmm. no you went to a fine art school and studied there so how no, i went to you... the best fine art school no no we went Correct. to a fine art school okay. <laughs> <laughs> how much was your high school music experience an influence on you to pursue music to go ahead and say you know i think i want to do this as a career oh my gosh okay so first of all i went to um and i know i know for, for, for plano i know for plano y'all forgive me but i have to go ahead and brag that i did go to the finest the best <laughs> Booker T. Washington High School for the Performing and Visual Arts, 2501 Flora Street, Dallas, Texas. <laughs> um, <laughs> but no, no, that was that was an that was an amazing experience. Our jazz uh, teacher was a guy named Bart Morantz, and how I even got introduced to the school, to, to the Arts Magnet School was in the beginning, my eighth grade year. They used to have this thing called Arts Jazz, and this particular year they had Take Six, uh, George Benson. Herbie Man and somebody, and so it was like a two day thing at the Mar- at the Morton H. Myerson Center. And I was like, you know, like, and that's when I found out it was being put on by the school, which was coincidentally next door. So I decided, you know, you know, I think I'm gonna try to school out. You know, my first, I don't know, my first seven weeks, we got visited by Wynton Marsalis. Uh, <laughs> it's like, it was like all these people that was coming up and they were like, you know, and they would come and they would, they would hang out with us, they play. Uh, Raw Hargrove is not in the, was a distinguished you know, alumni of the school. He would come up like all the time. Um, Branford Marcellus, uh, Kenny Kirkland. Uh, I mean, it was just it was always somebody coming, and so that's when I kind of started realizing that it was like, okay, I could probably do this because because at that time it was it was for fun and it was for church, right? Mm-hmm. But then I started seeing I started seeing these success stories, right? I started seeing all these success stories. Mm-hmm. It's like okay, I could probably do this, you know as a career and then my dad one time asked me like you know what do you want to do you know with your life that's all dads ask it's like i think i want to play music you know and i started telling him about all the experiences that i had at arts magnet and all the people that i, that I would see he was like you think you can make a career out of it I'm like I- i'll give it a shot you know but i really do i ascribe a lot of that back to my days arts magnet we would wake up school that starts at 9 15 we get to school at 7 30 just to share with each other you know, and Dr. Watkins would graciously sometimes even allow us, and this is probably illegal, so I probably shouldn't be saying it, but he would allow he would allow us to spend the night at school. And we play all day. We play all night. Now we were musty when it came time for the next day, but you know, <laughs> but we would play all day and all night, man. You know, and just that come and a lot of us we all still play together to this day. Braylon Lacey, Robert C. Wright, mm. uh R. C. Williams, uh Gordon Pope. We like we we all still play music, you know, religiously to this day together. It's the art and the hang, right? It's a big deal. Art and the hang, that's right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Uh, so Nicholas Munoz has a question. 
Uh, he says, if I'm interested in going to into music education in Texas, what are some, oh, the question uh, disappeared on me. Sorry. Uh, what, <laughs> what are some tips uh, or must knows for going into college to study music? Uh, wow. That's interesting. Um, what I would recommend is that, you know, whenever you go into a field that, well, I would, I mean, maybe not even just in the academic world, but in general, things in the academic world tend to be cookie cutter, you know, that's like, take this class, get this degree, you know, develop this curriculum. Um, and what I really love to see in teachers are, are like, is the same thing that I love to see in artists, which is I love to see teachers who engage with the way that they educate um, in the same way that Miles Davis engaged with the way that he created art, mm -hmm. you know, like with passion and with, with a unique style. So, you know, that Bart Morantz, Sean, I think is a great example of a teacher who had his own way of teaching, right? Oh, yeah. It's like, you know, he could have done the jazz school, typical jazz school curriculum. He could have taught in the same way that other people taught, but Bart taught the way that he taught because he was passionate about it and because he believed it was the right way and because he had his own style, like any artist, you know? I don't really like differentiating between artists and teachers, mm -hmm. you know, because a lot of the time, you know, there's this kind of, not 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 like a uh, animosity in any kind of way, but there's like a barrier that gets put up between them, you know? And I don't agree with that at all, you know? I, I think that there's a lot of art in teaching you know, sometimes more art in certain teachers than in artists. <laughs> you know, I think, Sean, you could definitely agree with that. We've seen people play Ooh. where like, man, this this person is doesn't have the same amount of art that my teacher had, you know? And um, so I would just say that. I would say don't, the, the main advice I would give is don't look down on what you're doing in any kind of way as, not, as being non-artistic, as being strictly pedagogical. Like, think about it as like, you're, you are an artist. And you're filling up a lot of people with your art. So, mm -hmm. you know, treat it that way. And always be looking for, like, the same thing as a musician, for what your thing is, what your style is, what your voice is, and develop that as a teacher. I know. Uh, and on that tip of getting into this industry, uh, sh uh, back to you, Sean, what steps should a young musician be taking to facilitate a career in the music industry? You've talked about, you know, you spoke to your dad, and, you know, then you, you went out there and started you know, finding some way to work. So what steps can uh, young students coming out of high school or maybe in their late years of high school facilitate a career in the music industry? Yeah, well, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of, um, of taking the college route. The reason why, and, and everybody doesn't have to do it. A lot of people, you know, they'll, they'll want to go to New York and struggle or do, or go to LA and, you know, in the, but the reason why I like the college route is because you make, and you meet people, you make great connections and you meet people. And a lot of times in this business, it's not really what you know, it really is who you know, you know? And I, um, there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, a, a record executive named Sean G. And we were having a, a, a we were having a conversation in LA a few months back. And we were talking about um, how people undervalue interns. And what I, what that means is is that like 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 they'll undervalue this this goes back to stop what, what you know who you know they'll undervalue interns because you know the intern eight times out of ten ends up becoming the major player <laughs> over time you know, because, you know so you know so when you're wanting to do this music business or you you, you want to get to the music thing well that intern that was running to get coffee today might be the president of a label tomorrow hmm. you know and and you know so. Again, the reason why I like college is because you you can foster relationships, you know, and still you know and, and still work, you know, you know, you know, still work, you know, and take, you know, take the the steps, but learn along the way, you know, you know, learn the people, learn learn the music, that's very important. Um, yeah, you know, <laughs> the big part of it. Music. Yeah, that's the big that's the big part of it. Um, you know, like you know, and foster you know, foster those relationships. I mean, you know, like you know, I'm sitting here with. I'm sitting here with, you know, on a, on a Zoom with one of the most, you know, charismatic and influential people, you know, that I'd ever met. But when I when I first met him, he was sitting, you know, sitting playing bass, um, Indian style in front of a Fender Rose and was killing it. And I was like, who is this guy? You know what I'm saying? You know, 
you know, it's, but that relationship was, it was forged. It was like, okay, you know, like, you know, this is a really, really cool thing. And, you know, and that, that, that really boils down to, you know, the, the, the gist of it, mm-hmm. you know, you know, you want, you want to get started, get started, but foster relationships, you know, yeah, you, you, know, you see those people for the rest of your life. You know, I mean, Sean, yeah. how many, you know, you see the people that you study with at North Texas for the Nora Jones, you know, right. Came yeah. back and we did, we did that gig together at Booker T and you're like, Hey, you know, y'all knew each other from school and you mm-hmm. know, you constantly bump into, to old friends. You know? Always. And, Always. And, and, and if you create a bad reputation for yourself in college, that stays with you, <laughs> you know, but similarly, if you create a good reputation for yourself in college as being a nice person who takes care of business and plays great that also stays with you you know mm-hmm. oh, sorry right sorry um are you cool okay <laughs> <laughs> phone was ringing off I like, what's going on? sorry <laughs> um as far as a viable career one student asks uh nicholas uh nicholas asks you know is music a viable career i know this last year in the pandemic you know i've had students graduate in college you know, coming into a world where everything's at standing still at the moment. Uh, and then if you're young as well in high school, the reality of that seems so far away, but is it really? Um, and so the question is, uh, could it be, is it a viable career? We've all had a great success and opportunity to live our dreams, I'm sure, but how do we translate that? How do we tell someone else, is it or isn't it? Even though we know the numbers, you know, the truth of the numbers, of not only what we make, but also the truth of how much time is required, I guess. So how do you see this? Uh, Nicholas wants to know, how do you see this as a viable career? Is it possible? <laughs> you want it? <laughs> who, 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 who said, uh, listen, you're in Spain. I'm in Dallas. You can answer that one. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, things are like seventy percent cheaper here. So, <laughs> so maybe you should answer. answer. <laughs> oh, no, that there's is your answer. answer. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, that's the answer. So there you go. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so um, no, I'm I'm happy to answer that. Um, when I went to North Texas, my first day of school, Ed Sof, who was the drum teacher there, said it was all the freshmen in one room, and he said, "Look to the eight people to the left." of you and look at the eight people to the right of you and just know that in that group of all those people two of you will have a career in music and one of you will like it (laughs) you know and i was like oh man maybe i made the wrong decision you know and it it was kind of like a discouraging message but the truth what the, the the idea that he was trying to convey to us was if you want if you're going to survive in this industry you can't coast like you really have to want it and you really have to try hard and you really have to give it all the love and all the passion and all the time and energy and respect that it deserves. And that was inspiring to me, actually, even though it was mm-hmm. also discouraging in that moment, it was inspiring to me. Um, but I want to kind of like, you know, throw the look at the flip side of that, which is that when I think of all the musicians that I know, that play very well that are very responsible take care of business and that are pleasant people to be around that have a great attitude there's not a single one of those people that i can think of that isn't beating away gigs with a stick i can't think of one person that has all three of those qualities that's like man i just don't have any gigs (laughs) like (laughs) like sean like lewis cato you know what i mean like Mm -hmm. think about people like that that like you know like th- this guy probably gets 15 gig offers every day, you know? So, so rather than thinking of it, like you said, you know, Rodney, you were talking about the numbers and the percentages mm-hmm. and the, the probability that you'll have a successful career in music. I wouldn't even think about that. I would think about yeah. what, what are the percentages of people that have these things that you have the power to develop that don't work. And I would say that percentage is probably zero. To, to the point where there's a lot of musicians that don't have all three things, but mm-hmm. they work a lot because they've got one mm-hmm. or two. Mm-hmm. Because we because there just aren't enough people that have all three, you know? So I would say, like, although there's a lot, you know, 
So I would say just think about it that way. Don't think about it as like success as this thing that you're just like trying to grab. Think of it as a consequence of developing these three very important attributes of your of your musical career, which are responsibility, like being cool, great attitude, and talent. You know, not talent. I don't want to say the word talent. I want to say ability mm-hmm. because you you can you can develop ability. You know. Um, so that, you know, that would be like my encouraging thing. So, and then what I say, is it viable? I mean, yes, of course it's viable. And also, you know, for me, 10 hours of working hard at music to me is the equivalent of about 15 seconds working at a bank. Mm. Because, you know what I mean? Because I love music. Mm -hmm. So if I love what I'm working at, it doesn't really feel like work. I don't like counting receipts. So for me, like, you know, 15 seconds of counting receipts to me is like, whoa, you know, maybe that for me is like a 19 hour day in a recording studio, you know, but I love it. I love it. It feeds me and it motivates me. And I know Sean's the same. We don't look at this as work, you know, we have to treat it that way in certain ways, you know, to make sure that we get paid. Yeah, of course. But like, it's not work. If you love it, you're going to, you're going to work harder for it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's just all about how much you love it, how much you believe in it. I would, I would say that really is what it it kind of ties right. back to like you were saying now how much hungrier you are now to learn you know mm-hmm. you once you get a bit of that you know level of working at this and being able to do it full time you're like yeah i want to do that more so absolutely you learning more mm-hmm. uh snarky puppy um when either of you are arranging i'll, I'll go with sean since uh, we were there with you mike for a minute uh when you're arranging a piece for snarky puppy what goes through your mind before you start to get the basics down this is from a student uh question well, I'm going to actually throw that back to Mike because I don't do a lot of arranging. Um, okay. the, but the, and the re- reason why I don't do a lot of arranging is because the band is full of arrangers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, of- <laughs> you do arranging. You're just one sixteenth of the arranging team. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, 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 pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. But, I mean, you know, but but the band's it, it's so many great arrangers and composers. You know, Mike League is a phenomenal composer. So I, I, I'll throw that back to him. Well, I mean, when we bring a thank you, Sean. I mean, when we bring a uh, when we bring a song in, if I bring a song into the band, it uh, you know I have it arranged, I have it written. But as soon as the band learns it, you know, like Sean said, he becomes one of the arrangers. You know what I mean? Like the whole band all of a sudden starts changing things to try to make the piece better. You know, um, but I will say that whenever we get to that part of the process the arranging part of the process, the composition part of the process is already done. So whoever has brought in the song has the melody, has the bass line, has the rhythms, has the harmony, all that stuff is done. And then the band learns that. And then the band starts putting in their, their input, you know, and, and yeah, it's not like I bring in a song and Sean says, okay, I'm going to be the arranger of this song, but maybe we're playing the song and Sean's like, you know, this would be better if I play this on this other keyboard. And then that inspires the drummer to say, oh, well, if he's playing on that keyboard, maybe I should change to this mm. drum here to make it. And then everybody's like, you know, in this very fluid kind of state of arranging. So um, yeah, basically a couple of years ago, I just started saying on all the records co-produced by Snarky Puppy, because, you know, at a certain point, it's like it's just it just becomes a band thing. Yeah. Right on. No. It's, a, it's own living organism from the seed yeah. that is planted. Right on. Yeah. That's all right. So we got like five minutes left. So I'm going to try for some quick fire questions here. Just uh, just go through, you know, I know when I'm young and I'm still now, I love gear. So what is uh, what is your choice for choosing what gear you play, whether uh, live? Michael, I'll go there for you. What What is it? Uh, what are you looking for when you're looking for something to play live as opposed to the studio? Um. Well, I think I, I use the same criteria, which is I want to use stuff that makes me feel something. You know, I want to feel, and that helps represent the sound that I'm looking for. Um, but I also like things that are easy, because I don't like to sit around and read, read instruction manuals, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like fighting with loop pedals for like six years before I know how to use one, you know. Like, I like, like my bass, my electric bass, which is over there, has two knobs on it. You know, it has a volume knob, it has a tone knob, it has four strings that I don't change unless one breaks. You know, I'm like on my 10th year on this set of straight. Like, I like I like things that are easy, you know, like easy, simple, like let me, you know, so that it leaves space for me to worry about the music and not yeah. worry about like, 
you know, nine different sets of EQ on my bass amp. You know, I like things that are simple and sound good and let me think about the art. So that's basically where, nice. where I'm at. I'm not very technologically evolved. I think Sean is much, much more developed in that category than I am. But also, Sean, I, similar, yeah. right? I don't know. Sean, do you, what, what do you like to play on live or versus the studio? Uh, well, you know, nowadays, the studio is a big computer with a bunch of plugins, so it's not really much to that. Uh, that's, I mean, yeah, I, just, I, I like to play a lot. <laughs> studio also laptops, back to pro. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> you know, it. Every imaginable, every imaginable plugin. But but live, I like to play on things that I can emote with. So, you know, I'm, I'm a very emotional uh, player. Like, I like to be able to, you know, you know, to be, I like to be able to express you know, so I like, you know, so even with Snarky, you know, I play the talk box a lot, uh, you know, moves and mainly just, you know, chord chronos. Cool. But you know, right. it's just something I can, I can you can feel it. Nice. Yeah. All right. The real quick, a student asked, um, um, uh, Scott Sinetti asked for each of you, which has been one of your most memorable performances? You, you want the truth or you want to lie? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, mean, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't, I couldn't, I couldn't even begin to answer that, man. So, I, I know Michael's here, but you know, you could, you could go ahead and say without. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, we just, we just, That's we just, it. before the pandemic, we just played with 132 dates. You know, I didn't so, hear so, any of that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, we, I mean, we had, we had some good times in 2019. So I, it's hard, it's hard to really, you know, you know dwindle yeah. it down. Uh, um, I think my most memorable one would be when I, I played with Timbaland and we played at Twickenham Stadium. Um, we were able to all the same build with Beyonce and Madonna. That was pretty memorable. I know. Right <laughs> yeah. Uh, cool. yeah. Mike, um, Mike, do you have a memorable one? Yeah. Um, I would say uh, North Sea Jazz about mm. seven years ago in Rotterdam. Um, our drummer, uh, that had like a travel issue at the last minute and he couldn't make it to the gig. And, and we were like, this is the day of the show. And it was our first time at North Sea. It was our, I think our first time playing European festivals actually. So it was like the gig that would basically determine whether we have a good mm -hmm. reputation in Europe and whether we get on the festival circuit or not. And then we lost our drummer, you know, and I was calling every drummer from Texas that was at North Sea. I was talking with Eric Harlan and Kendrick Scott and all like, do you think you'd be able to play? They're like, yeah, my gig's at five, but maybe I can come and may I won't have any time to listen to the music, but we can just vibe or what, you know? And I was like, oh man. And Corey Henry, who was playing keyboards in Snarky Puppy at that time, came up to me. He was like, let me play drums. <laughs> and I was like, what? I was like, no, we need you playing keyboards. And like, I never heard you play drums. I'm not just gonna just put you up playing drums in front of thousands of people. And he was like, you're always talking about how important it is to play the song. And I know the songs. So I said, <laughs> All right, you got the gig. And he played drums on the gig and it went great. Wow. And, and he saved our butts. And so that that was like the biggest stress and the biggest stress relief in one gig for me. You know? That's amazing. I didn't even know he played drums either. I see him all the time sure, playing keys. Sure does. So. He sure does. Well, cool. We're, we are 1050 on the dot. And uh, I just want to thank you guys for joining us, taking time out of your day to, you know, just share your knowledge, your experience, your wisdom. Uh, a lot of this music is about, again, approach and thought process. So hopefully the students uh, could get some of that from these questions. Uh, to everyone who contributed questions, thank you so much. I hope uh, everyone enjoyed this. And uh, so, yeah, go out and make some great music, make some music history, and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, have a great week. Thanks, Rodney. Good luck to everybody out there. Thanks, Rodney. Cheers. See you later.